I have uh, Sandy Brenner here from Houston County Medical Center, and she brings 37 years of experience in nutrition today. And not only is she a registered dietitian, she has her PhD in food and nutrition and is also a certified diabetes educator. So let's give Sandy a warm Mercer welcome. Thank you. Hello, everyone. If you cannot hear me, oh, well, okay. If you cannot, oh, now you can hear me. If you cannot hear me, you know, raise your hand or if you get some feedback, let me know. It's really nice to be here today. When they called and asked me, he said there might be 50, and I said, 50 on a break must be a free lunch. <laughs> yes. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit today about diet. I am going to whip through my slides at the speed of light and uh, answer questions, because here you have lots of questions. A uh, good, healthy diet is not rocket science. You hear it every time you turn around. You hear so much stuff. Everybody's got a new gimmick, and we're gonna, I'm sure you have lots of questions about the most recent gimmicks. Dr. Oz alone keeps me hopping with his <laughs> new stuff all the time. Uh, let's talk, let's start out with the basics real quick. You all know this, this is the basics. We're gonna have dietary fat modifications, increasing your fiber, cutting your sodium, less simple sugars, adequate exercise, healthy weight, and good meal spacing. Uh, we spend a lot of time talking about how to uh, space meals. Um, and the most important thing that I say and I, uh, is that if it wasn't a food 200 years ago, you probably shouldn't be eating it now. And you will be amazed how your diet would change if you actually followed that. I'm not necessarily saying to go with the Paleolithic diet. That's too far back. <laughs> Let me say something about recipes, because I was asked to talk about recipes. I don't personally use them anymore. I haven't needed a recipe in so long. And I, I tell you what I used to tell my college kids when I taught for years and years. Um, you only need three cookbooks if you need that. First, you need a Better Homes and Gardens and several different editions. I have three or four. I buy a new one every three or four years. And that's the basics. There's hardly anything that you, hey, I even have a, an app on my cell phone now from that. Joy of Cooking is a good encyclopedic cookbook. So if you are running into something you've never heard of before and want to look it up, it's right there. And your mother-in-law's church cookbook. Now, I was talking to college kids. When you get married and you want to cook like your mother-in-law does, you get the little church book that all the little ladies put together, and you've got it made right there. Otherwise, it's the internet. You put what food you have in the search engine, and a miracle happens. I'm, I'm, very, I'm very fond of the craft.com website. I think you know it's a real handy place to get recipes, but the American Diabetes Association, the American Heart Association, the American Cancer Association, all those people have recipe search engines, plus it's mass. So you're looking for heart healthy or cancer friendly or, or whatever you're looking for. The internet has more than enough stuff. I'm an avid gardener and if I get a bunch of Brussels sprouts or I get a bunch of eggplant, it's just much easier to enter that in the search engine and ask for recipes based on what I have than it is to sit down and go through a book. Now some of you collect them. I find cookbook collectors rarely actually cook out of them. They look at them and they collect them. And that's a, about it. People today are not very good cooks. I hate to tell this. But one of the problem we have is young people today aren't taught to cook. They really don't, wouldn't know what to do with a recipe book if you did give it to them. It's quite often, and I haven't taught college in 17 years, basic foods. But even 17 years ago, they would pull a skillet out from under the sink and ask me if that was a soft saucepan. And these are 18-year-olds, college freshmen and sophomores, who have no idea how to put anything together. It's kind of scary in the lab sometimes. But anyway, that's my thing about recipes. Uh, we're going to hear a lot about, you know, for years we taught about cholesterol. For years we taught about everything. But now we know that inflammation is the name of the game. Things, foods, nutrients that we used to say were good for your heart, we now know they tend to be anti-inflammatory. Things that we said, oh, you know, that'll clog your arteries. We, we really know now they tend to cause inflammatory response. I hate to say that sandwich you're eating <coughs> is fried. <coughs> and although it started out in good old peanut oil, 
a few minutes in that deep fat fryer, it doesn't look like anything God made anymore. Okay. And a deep fat fryer, and hey, were there deep fat fryers 200 years ago? I don't know. You ever tried to regulate heat over a campfire? It's not easy. And besides that, they didn't have oils. And, you know, purifying an oil is a modern thing to have an oil so pure that it will take, you know, that kind of heat without smoking. And so um, this is a very modern thing. But like I said, you know, oil doesn't look much like what God made pretty quickly after it's hit that deep fire. Not, not to depress you on that free lunch or anything. <laughs> red meat. I'm going to talk about red meat. Red meat is any animal that walks on four legs on planet Earth. I do not care how many times the pork people want to call themselves the other white meat. Limit. Now, this is what I taught for years. I don't really teach this much anymore. I don't teach red meat versus white meat near as much as I used to. This is what I teach now all the time. And I'm about to go from preaching to meddling, which is processed meats. It's the processing. The cancer people, everybody's looking at this. Processed meats are meats that have been usually ground up, may or may not be cured, injected, uh, sodium, everything from sodium nitrate to whatever. It comes in those wrapped packages and has a nice salty taste. Uh, this, and I'm talking about hot dogs and bologna and bacon and sausage and all of those things that Southerners eat at a larger and higher rate than any region of the United States and have the blood pressures to prove it. You do live in the middle of the stroke belt. Now, it doesn't matter whether it's made of turkey or bacon. Turkey bacon has more salt in it than beef bacon. And I can't tell you how many clients will say, well, I'm going to have turkey bacon. Well, I've switched to turkey sausage. And I have to look them in the eye and say, I don't care. It's the word bacon and the word sausage. Little lady goes to me. She says, I did exactly what you said. I went to the, to the um, meat market and I asked for some unprocessed ham, plain ham. You know that stuff has no taste? <laughs> I said, yeah, pigs are not born with all that salt in their butt. And you're used to eating it processed with all that salt. And Southerners have the unique thing is that in your ancestors used a lot of salt cured meat to make beans and peas taste better, cheap food tastes better, and tastes like there's actually meat in it. My granddaddy ate this way and he never had these problems. Your granddaddy would have had to own the whole South Georgia to afford all the meat that, that you eat on the side of those beans and peas and greens that you eat loaded up. The, your ancestors did not eat that way. And even if they did, they got up and went out and worked for a living. Monounsaturates. I know you're going to may or may not ask me about that. The fatty acids are a big a hot thing. I promote olive oil, canola oil, peanut oil. Most tree nuts are filled with those monounsaturates. When I went to uh, my PhD, monounsaturates were totally ignored. We didn't think they did anything. You know, we went for the polyunsaturates and everything was corn oil and safflower and sunflower oil. You don't hear, the, hear about those anymore. Everything's monounsaturated. Uh, the secret is, well, I put good peanut oil in my deep fat fryer. All right, I told you about that. Don't matter in about, you know, what you put in the deep fat fryer in a short period of time, it's, it's broken down. Let's talk about, I spend more time talking about sodium restriction. Let's look at 200 years ago again. 200 years ago, food was not processed much, and salt had to be brought in from the nearest ocean. Yeah, sea salt. All salt is sea salt. All of it. You know, oh, well, it's refined. Yeah, they went to some big old salt banks and they actually processed the salt. They took the dirt out of it, good, and they made it a unique crystal size. Yeah, processed the tar out of it. It's a rock. And sea salt is stuff you find along the ocean. You know, pick it up and it comes in larger crystals and it's probably a little dirty. So when they tell you that sea salt has less sodium, it's like saying granulated sugar has less sugar in it than powdered sugar. <laughs> when you look at the crystal size, 
the powdered sugar has a finer crystal, so you can pack more in. Okay? But salt is, salt is, salt is salt, and sea salt is not more natural. You know, we're not talking natural. They, oh, it's natural. I said, yeah, nature just wiped out a city in Oklahoma. Nature doesn't mean safe, by the way. Natural. I mean, you know, can be good, can be bad. Uh, generally, when you look back 200 years ago, sodium was hard to come by. Foods from the ground have almost no sodium in it. Uh, you know, there's some in meat and milk, but it's really not very high. Uh, celery is about the only vegetable that's high in sodium naturally. Everything else is basically zero. And so your ancestors, who sodium is needed in your body, it helps you regulate fluid, your ancestors had to be able to reutilize sodium, hang on to it, treat it like it were gold. Potassium, on the other hand, is everywhere. Fruits and vegetables are loaded in this stuff. So 100 years ago, our kidneys that regulated our fluids were designed to see a whole lot of potassium and very little sodium, and we have the mechanisms in our body that are very happy with that. And that has totally reversed in the last 50 years. Now we see mass quantities of sodium. I mean, unbelievably mass quantities of sodium. And because we don't eat all those fresh fruits and vegetables, and processing takes to take, seems to take the potassium out, we're seeing less potassium. So we have an entire switch. We've gone from a lot of sodium, I mean, little sodium and a lot of potassium, and we've totally switched it and expect everything to work fine. And for the most part, it does. The question isn't why do we have so much high blood pressure and so much problems with sodium. The question is why we don't have more. And a lot of people just eat the salt and never have a problem with it because your kidneys are capable of dealing with that. But not all of us are that lucky. And societies that eat low salt diets do not have elevated blood pressures as they age. There are not very many of those societies, by the way. But um, that it, it, it and for those of you who are salt sensitive, lowering the sodium in your diet, all I'm asking you to do is to be natural. You know, go back 200 years ago and change the ratio back to the way you were designed to work. And since the average southerner eats seven to 10,000 milligrams of sodium a day, cutting back to 2,000 is like pulling teeth. And now the big argument is, we can't get that, why, you know, those low sodium diets may not work. You know, the government wants you to go to 1,500 milligrams a day. We don't even have a 1,500 milligram diet in our hospital. We can hardly get the 2,000 one. I, I sit in my hands and knees and pray that my clients can stay down around 4,000 milligrams a day. Oh, 1,500 is too low. I said, well, name me a few Americans who actually eat a 1,500 milligram sodium diet, and we'll see. Technically, you can get by on 300 a day. 300 a day. 500 is the considered uh, the lower limit of safe. So even 1,500 is, is plenty adequate. Uh, so they're going to argue back and forth, but it doesn't hurt us to eat less than 4,000 milligrams of sodium a day, which is about two teaspoons, a little less than two teaspoons of salt, but we have so many other sodium additives. And I might point out that Southerners eat all those quick breads, biscuits, uh, 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 cornbread, muffins, waffles, cookies, cakes. Those are made with something called baking powder, and the main ingredient in baking powder is baking soda. And we eat, wet, and those are also high-fat breads. You know, where loaf bread is much lower in fat, biscuits, muffins, cornbread are all much fattier and contain baking powder. They're quick because the leavening doesn't have to rise. So when I say a low sodium diet is restrictive, it does feel that way generally. Okay, we have looked at that. Okay, we've looked at that. Let's look at that label. First thing you look at, what's the first thing you look at on the label? Who said that? Okay, I'm going to show you this and then I'm going to give it to you. What did I do with it? Oh, I forgot to mention this when I was mentioning recipes. This is diabetic cooking. It's a very inexpensive little periodical. It is written by clinical dietitians, registered dietitians. I love the recipes. These are the recipes that I would make. 
I used to, when I used to do cooking classes down in House and Medical, we used to actually have cooking classes. This is where I tended to get my recipes. So if I could get through the ads here, I'd show you the picture. Pretty pictures of everything, and it's it's not like jo of of the big fancy cooking magazines where you don't know what half the ingredients are and can't figure out what half of the things to do. This is useful. Who told me serving size? Consider the gift. <laughs> Serving size is the first thing you look at. Then calories, just fine. Or because, you know, here there's two, the conserve, this is a two cup container. You know, you look at soup, soup, oh, the packets of some of the salad dressings in restaurants have two servings in them. Now they give it to you as an individual. And it's got a thousand milligrams of sodium per serving. But my clients, even after they've been through my classes, will turn that thing over and I'll say, how much sodium if you use that soda dressing? And they'll tell me a thousand. And I said, what was that rule you broke getting into such a hurry to tell me? Forgot to look at the serving size and multiply times two. Soups are bad about that. Who eats one cup of soup? You know, low calorie, you, you, nobody eats one cup of soup. They eat two to three cups. Got to multiply that sodium by two and three. Ramen noodles are the bane of my existence. They should be tra Ramen noodles kill young people. They cost 10 cents. They've got, a z they got a quite a few calories in it and no redeeming characteristics whatsoever and enough salt. I really don't like the American Football League advertising soup that eats like meals either because young African-American children are watching that and think soup's good for them. And what kills our African-Americans? High blood pressure and its relative diseases. So the last thing we want them thinking is that soup eats like a meal. I'm not anti-soup, but most of that canned soup is just a walking, talking salt bin. Yep, yep, I'm getting on my high horse and I'll not get done. Uh, these are, in fact, I blanked out. You probably have more in your handout than I'm going to show you, but this just goes through and looks at, at the salt content of various things. Um, also here we've got uh, whole grains only. I'm a big promoter of whole grains. They're not the end all. Yes, I know there's a book called Wheat Belly. We can talk about that if you want. Uh, legumes, big bean, bean and pea fan. As long as you don't put too much ham, fat, back, streaking, bacon, grease, and ham hock in it. Uh, it's got a lot of advantages and recipes galore, so that's always a fun thing. Eat one and a half cups of fruit daily. Notice I did not say juice. I'm an anti-juice person. They did not do juice 200 years ago. And if they did, they were making booze. <laughs> they had booze 200 years ago. I'm not taking your booze away, but I am telling you that you don't need the juice. Okay, two and a half cups of vegetables daily. I mean, that's minimal. I'll never forget talking to a client one time. Oh, I love vegetables. You know, when they say they love vegetables, and then you do 24-hour recalls, you can pretty well set your watch by the fact they haven't eaten a vegetable in three days. But at least they'll say they love it. And she, I said, oh, I love vegetables. And so we were going through a diet, and finally she said, she says, you want me to eat them every day? <laughs> and, and that's how people think. Uh, nuts and seeds are good sources and goodies. And nuts and seeds tend to not have much carb in it. And since I am a diabetes educator, we're always finding things that people can snack on that isn't going to affect their blood sugar and so nuts and seeds, so almonds and walnuts and one of my diabetes clients said the other day, he says, yeah, those nuts. He says, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven when you said that. He says, my wife came up to my office the other day, went through all the drawers in my desk, took out all my cans of almonds and, and cashews and walnuts and everything. She, he said, she said, you've gained 10 pounds. You get no more all the nuts you want. And so she's, now he gets this little baggie with his two or three tablespoons of nuts for a snack in the afternoon. Because he thought, oh, I can have all the nuts I want. So he's pulling open the drawer, eating all of it, and gaining weight. They are high in fat. Here's, now, if I were doing this today, I'd probably rearrange it. This is, these are about a year old. One, you don't hear much about fortified margarines anymore. It used to be big, the Stanols 
were given, they tended to lower cholesterol. They still haven't proved that lowering your cholesterol will actually lengthen your life. That's a big if with research. This is an educated crowd. You know, researchers, you know, we make the assumption, well, lowering cholesterol will work. Yeah, we don't know that. Uh, cholesterol is a hard-working molecule. If I had my long sides, I would tell you here, and, and you, we can't live without it. And it's been an indicator of a problem, but it itself is probably not a problem. Um, it's, we're back to inflammation. We're beginning to see that it ain't the hard work in cholesterol, it's the inflammation that may or may not be there. Um, but anyway, psyllium is the f fiber that you get in the pills. And, you know, I used to, oh, eat the food with fiber. Now I go, if the only way I can get fiber down is some fiber con, take it. Uh, whole oat products, oat is the only grain that can have the seal of the American Heart Association. And I still like to know how Cheerios, oh, the Cheerio people, and I have a laugh every so often when I run into them at meetings. I said, I can't believe you have the nerve to put the your heart association, because it's, and oh my, oh, I eat Cheerios. Cheerios have no fiber in them. Have you read the label? They don't have enough to be worthwhile. Those oatmeal things over there at least have five. Uh, but because they're made, and it does have a little beta glucagon, you can go over there, you know, oats. But oatmeal is, is the whole grain. And you all know that oatmeal's slimy, right? If you haven't slopped around in some oatmeal, that's the stuff that got it, the Heart Association seal. Only oats have that as grain. That the beta glucagons that are, the, it's a water soluble fiber. We're back to the same, beans have as much or more of it. So the same stuff that's in beans is what's in oats. Uh, fatty fish, the omega-3s, now we've got the krill oils and we're starting the big war there. Well, we have only DHA, not E, you know, and they're arguing over which omega-3 is good. And you know, this is all driven by who owns the patent on it. Um, soy protein, you know, it, unfortunately, ladies, it hasn't been proven to help with the hot flashes. <laughs> Sorry. Soy protein is a bean. It's got more fiber in it than other beans and keeps half the world alive. And I'm a big soy proponent. I do not recommend soy protein powders. I don't recommend any protein powder. I got a call today. Well, I'm taking all these whey proteins, which is a byproduct of the cheese industry that they used to throw away, and now they discovered they can sell to people who think they need a lot of extra protein. You know, it's also used in baby formulas. We can talk about that all day long, but uh, I usually say, oh, you're on protein supplements. You mean uh, powdered milk, because nine out of 10 of those protein supplements, you know, only God makes protein. Only God makes protein. So if you have a protein supplement, you have to get it from somewhere, don't you? What's the cheapest thing? Milk. It's a complete protein. It's got, you know, milk, eggs, soy. It comes from one of them. So anytime you buy a protein powder, you're buying milk, eggs, or soy at, soy at about six times the price, or eight or 10 or 12 or 50 times the price. Grape juice and red wine, and used to, you know, it just hasn't panned out as good as they want. See, they keep trying to find the chemical inside the food that does the work. We know red wine does the work. But nobody wants to drink wine. Well, they want to drink it, and nobody wants to, so they want to make a pill. The pill hasn't worked too good. The red wine still works pretty good. And the red grape juice. My trouble with the red grape juice is it is way too high in sugar. And most of my clients who need this does, do not need the fructose and the sugar. So eat grapes or drink wine. Yeah, somebody prefers the wine. Cranberry juice, just got a call about that today from a bodybuilder who was concerned that he wanted to take more cranberry juice, but it has all the sugar in it. Of course, I told him there's sugar-free cranberry juice, you know, at the local store if he looks for it, or he can actually get those in pill form. But the point is, I said, you're not diabetic. Why, you know, a little extra sugar's not gonna hurt you. And he says, well, I have to because I'm taking all these protein powders and they told me it was hard on my kidneys. I said, is there anything wrong with your kidneys? No. Protein doesn't hurt kidneys. Protein works kidneys. A little work never hurt anybody. But if your kidneys are damaged from high blood pressure and diabetes, yeah, then we have to take the protein away from you. But it wasn't the protein that caused the problem. 
Uh, there's a lot of misinformation so much out there. Well, you know, you, like, like sugar causes diabetes. No, it don't. Doesn't help it, <laughs> but you have to be genetically prone to diabetes. And even if you're genetically prone to diabetes, eating a lot of sugar doesn't necessarily bring it on. You have to have some other confounding factors. Eggs with omega-3 fatty acids, these are the, you know, all, they, all you have to do to get eggs with omega-3s is feed fish oil to chickens and they put more omega-3s in their eggs. Green tea and black tea, big. If I could just get Southerners to leave the two and a half cups of sugar per gallon out of the tea, this would work out. Milk is also a problem in tea. That is the reason the British do not get the hard advantage of all the tea they drink compared to those on the continent. For cause some, and I'm a big milk fan too, grew up on a dairy farm, but um, for some strange reason, when you add milk to these, these products, they, they don't, the antioxidants don't seem to absorb as well. Coffee is the number one antioxidant in the American diet, but so many Americans are gonna put milk in it. T2. Now, a cup of sugar has 840 calories, half of it in fructose. I'm talking table sugar. A high fructose corn syrup is 50-50. They made the mistake when they named it, uh, saying the word fructose or fructose, however you want to say that, in it, not realizing there is no difference. I don't care what Dr. Oz says. There is no difference between table sugar and high fructose corn sugar and fruit juice. Sugar is sugar is sugar. But there is a difference with agave. Agave is 70% fructose. Won't raise your blood sugar, but will run your lipids up sky high. Don't use it unless you're making tequila. That's what it's for, making tequila. Yeah. Fermented dairy products, big, big, yogurt, probiotics, everything fermented. Everybody's learned to make kimchi. Uh, even the um, kimchi is fermented cabbage. Even the uh, diabetes uh, websites are, are loaded, I mean dietetic websites. All the dietitians are learning how to make kimchi and all the other fermented products that are big now. You know, we just, they changed their policy and now we can suck on the pacifiers of our children and eat before them and after them because guess what? All that saliva and exchange of bacteria is actually good. Some of the new work they're doing uh, in working with lower GI problems is called fecal transplants. That doesn't sound good, does it? It's exactly what it sounds like. They've even done some research that says that when people have gastric bypass for weight loss, because you, as you know, diets don't work. People diet and diet and get fatter and fatter. And that is another hour long reason to explain. But uh, diets don't work. But they just heard some research at a cardiometabolic conference that said that after gastric bypass, the GI tract changes and they did some fecal transplants and found other people lost weight at almost the same rate as the guy with the gastric bypass when they did fecal transplants off. So one of these days you may go to the doctor for, ugh, never mind. Tree nuts, for lunch. Tree nuts, again, we talked about. Eat more of these. This is not, oh, and er, colors. Lots of colors. Raspberry ketones are big. Has anybody here heard of raspberry ketones? You know what ketones are? They're fat metabolites. Most of us know that, but they're also what gives fruit their smell. You know, they're, they're four carbon acids. And so, the, and they take ketones and they put it in your ink pen and your ink pen smells like strawberry. You know, the scratch and sniffs, ketones. I, I really don't know, but I have clients that swear by that for their blood sugars. It doesn't make any sense to me at all, and seems like $35 down the drain, but I, I've learned any more that, you know, as long as it's only $35 and they can afford it, try it. Tell me how it works. You know what I do when somebody has a new plan like this? I do this routinely. You take this and you'll lose a thousand pounds, you know, and da 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 da. So I said, okay, and I go home and I get on my calendar and I swip my calendar to a year ahead and I write a note that says, ask so and so about miracle pill, okay? If they're still as gung ho about it a year later, I'm gonna spend $35 and try it just to see myself. I do that routinely, and then a year goes by, I'm usually asking, hey, you know that stuff that you were selling that somebody sold you, whatever, how's that going? You get, oh yeah, well, yeah, yeah. They're on to the new thing, they're selling me something else. 
Oh, dairy. Now, having said fat-free, I'm still standing by low-fat dairy. Although one of these days they're going to find a miracle in the low-fat and the dairy fat, and we'll all be taking dairy fat pills. My husband goes, well, according to your theory, Sandy, now that uh, coffee has become the new health food, we'll see coffee pills. So here we were. He elbowed me hard a few months ago at Sam's when they had the green coffee pills for sale. I said, I told you. You know, I told you when the cinnamon pills came down. Exactly. All of this happens. Because don't snort the cinnamon. You do know that, that there's a difference in there, right? Stay away from salt, fried food, sugared beverages, processed meat, refined starches, too much candy and sweets, butter, margarine, and gravy. I don't think these are going to change next week. I don't think there's going to be a thing that comes out that says, oh, we made a mistake. You know, like chocolate. Chocolate's now a health food, especially dark chocolate. See, the milk causes the problem. So milk chocolate doesn't have the effect that dark chocolate does. Because when you add milk to these antioxidants, for some weird reason, hot cocoa is not going to give you the antioxidant bunch as if you, you know, the Mexicans, and the, they put cocoa in, in hot bitter things, in hot things. Moly. Have you ever eaten moly? You're going, ugh. I thought it would be sweet. It's got chocolate in it, right? Nope. It's got cocoa powder. You know, cocoa powder, good. Mix it with milk so it tastes good, and <laughs> it's not so good. I think we're getting to the end. Okay. Uh, this is amazing for me. Uh, do you have any questions? Yes. I tried buying some uh, sunflower seeds to chew on those. It's going to swallow that stuff. It's really hard. Uh, that's the seed on the outside. Did you get just the seed, the inside, or did you get the shell on it? Yeah, the shell, and you got to bite them open in the inside, the seeds on the inside. But you can get them seeded. The problem with sunflower seeds are almost always salted. And my husband, when he quit, after we got married, he quit smoking. Or he quit chewing tobacco, which he'd started up after he quit smoking. Uh, you know, and the sunflower seeds, you know, would build up everywhere. But, um, uh, yeah, that, that. Now, I, it won't hurt you to chew it up and eat it. It's just fiber. But... You're not supposed to. <laughs> it's fiber, all right. <laughs> it takes some serious chewing and then, you know, to do that. Nah, nah, nah. People eat rocks and glass and everything else. <laughs> GI tract is the most adaptive surface on this planet. And, and you got a football, a half a football field full of absorptive surface back there, and it takes something to hurt it. My daughter is a gastroenterologist. And she, in Shands, which is a hospital down in Jacksonville, Florida, and of course they take all the people prisoners from the jail, and every time the guys at the jail want to get out for an afternoon, they swallow the most interesting things. So she gets to fish them out. And they have no problem. They have razor blades, ink pens, pencils, open, uh, 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 Pin, uh, uh, safety pins, you name it. She was so mad one night, she came through at 3 o'clock and told the lady the next time she showed up, she better hope she wasn't on call because she was doing this without anesthesia. <laughs> she says, I don't think I can get away with it, but I did scare. At least she wasn't smiling when I walked in. But, uh, you know, so it's amazing. They kind of wish that, because when it gets through the, out of the stomach into the small intestines, then the surgeons have to come in and the gastroenterologist can roll over and go back to sleep. Another question. Yes. Um, on the teeth, the green tea or the black tea, is there decaffeinated? Are they still? As far as I know, the decaffeination is okay. You know, they do have to add, you know, go to a lot of trouble. Now, caffeine is one of those things that has gone from evil to good. The feeling that you get, yeah. Decaffeinated tea is the. It doesn't change the antioxidants that I know of at all. Still very useful. Question. Well, since you raised that question, I want to pick up on that, and then I ask another question. Sure. Is it very? Is uh, because I was told by my doctor or some PA that coffee, if you're trying to watch your, you know, help blood pressure, that caffeinated coffee is not good. It's How old is this person? The person, she's probably about 40 or 40. 
Well, because that's, that's fairly old. You know, we used to take caffeine away from everybody. Couldn't figure out why post-surgery patients have those headaches. <laughs> Just give them their coffee, they do fine. We only take coffee away anymore with people with arrhythmias that have arrhythmia problems. If your heart isn't beating, and any effect that caffeine has is very temporary. So if it does have, it's a very temporary bump. It would probably raise your blood pressure more to get off the caffeine. <laughs> now, caffeine containing beverages, and of course they've done a lot of work now, it's an ergogenic aid. It gives you energy. And, you know, it's used a lot by the sports people. You know, they used to test for it, but now they gave up on that and let you caffeinate. But, um, uh, now, most people will drink the amount of caffeine that they're comfortable with. They get too much, get the shakes and the up. But even keeping you awake, it's only got about a 20 minute latency. You know, about 20 minutes they'll keep you awake. And that's not long enough to drive across country. So if you're dependent on caffeine to drive all night, you may have an accident. And certain races and gene pools are more susceptible to it. And some of you can drink coffee by the gallon and go right to sleep. You know, it just doesn't affect you much. It does cause the fatty acids to be burned a little bit. Yes? Yeah, my other question was, uh, you mentioned whole grains earlier. And I re read something recently that whole grains are not very good for you. Oh, you say the wheat belly, oh, you know, I tell you, the, the big thing now is celiac. And, uh, or gluten-induced enteropathy. It's the, alert, it's the allergy to gluten. And gluten is the protein that's in wheat, rye, uh, barley and buckwheat, and it what is what forms the net. It's a protein. When you mix it with water, it comes out and it, and it forms kind of a balloon or a net, which catches the leavening gas, glass, uh, gases, excuse me, and allows the bread to rise. So that's the reason tortillas are so flat. You could do anything with cornmeal that you want, and you are not going to get it ever to look like bread. You have to get the the wheat that has the gluten in it. And there are a lot of people, uh, celiac is an autoimmune disease, and it's considered a gateway disease. It's the most common of the autoimmune diseases. It tends to run higher in people with European background. Uh, you know, so it, it tends to run in the European background gene pools. And if you are sensitive to gluten, you can either have a severe case or a mild case. But it's considered a gateway, and they think that it causes leaking in the gut, which will bring on type 1 diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, other types of autoimmune diseases. And so there's a lot of research in it right now. If you're not allergic to gluten, going off gluten has no particular advantage to you, and it's a royal pain. And people tell me they're gluten-free all the time, and then they're not careful. You have to clean out your kitchen. I mean, any little bit of gluten will set you back. It's not how much. Everybody thinks it's dose-related, so if I just get a small amount, I'll be okay. We're talking about noodles and, and pastas and, and thickening agents. and I mean, this stuff is everywhere. This, you know, this has to be a science. For people who have gluten-induced enteropathy, it looks a lot like Crohn's disease sometimes, or just an unexplained anemia for some people. Um, when this happens, um, and they go gluten-free and they do it right, it's like a miracle. I tell them, I said, if you've got really bad GI problems, get out on your knees and pray that it's, it's celiac, because we can fix that. But it isn't easy. And it's become this fad, like it's a health fad. And, wheat, and we, if you read the book Wheat Belly, they're just not taking wheat away from you. They're taking all the refined starches potato starch, everything, and that's fine. It won't hurt you to go give it up, but most people find that that's a bit more, a bit more difficult than they bargained for, and it's not easy to live in this world, gluten, I mean, uh, following the book Wheat Belly, but, you know, uh, so uh, it's, it's, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Basically, it has. However, I get the kind of orange juice that says it's one half the amount of sugar. Well, orange juice by nature is, is got sugar in it. Sometimes they add it, but they can take they can take it out too. It's it's just sugar. It's fructose. It's got a lot of fructose. That's the reason fructose is called fruit sugar. Fructose is much sweeter than glucose, 
So fruit by nature has a lot of fructose in it and it makes it a lot sweeter. Um, I, would, I would dare to tell you you're better off with the orange. You can suck down two and a half oranges with that orange juice. You know, it's a convenience food. It's dismembered, dismembered convenience food that's highly processed orange juice. But they can, sh they have convinced you it's the next to godliness. If you're not diabetic and you drink it in moderation, I don't care. They don't make orange booze, so you know, it's about your only. Uh, 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 it's got a lot of folic acid in it and those kind of things. Now, the labels costs a lot of money to keep those labels up and in a pasture, in a pasture from one end of a field of beans to the other there's more than a 10% various variation in the iron content in one, in one big field. So the labels are kind of averaged. You know we used to say oh there's 250 milligrams of cholesterol in an egg. Well now we know it varies anywhere from like 65 to 300. It's huge variation, the size of the egg, you know, what the, you know, it, and so that's the problem with labeling, quote, natural foods. You know, there's a lot of variation in it. So you're just getting an average. And yeah, it would have less sugar, but you always look at the calories. Sugar has five, cal four calories a gram. So if they really took the sugar out, there'd be less calories in it. So that's another way of determining how true they are. And orange juice doesn't have anything but carb in it anyway, so there wouldn't be any other calorie source. It doesn't have much protein. Fruit doesn't have protein, doesn't have fat. And so the only other calorie source that can be in there is sugar. So if it really has half the sugar, it would have significantly fewer calories. Do you have a question back there? Uh, what is your recommendation for protein if you don't like meat? Oh, well, there are ve vegetarians or vegan, are you vegan or just vegetarian? Ovolacto, if you're just ovolacto, eggs are the highest biological value protein there is. And um, when the protein studies were done, originally they were done on rats, and rats and humans are not the same. But they didn't realize that for many, many years. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Rats actually need, <laughs> rats, is, rats need a different amino acid profile slightly than we do. So actually we do much better on plant proteins than would have been predicted, which, you know, rice doesn't do near as bad as they thought. <laughs> Otherwise half the world would be dead. Uh, but, but um, so beans and peas and soy, and we used to say that you had to mix them in a meal, so you had to have a, a grain and a legume together to change the profiles and all that. They've kind of backed off on lots of that. You know that you don't have to have it all in the same meal and, and this type of thing. The only time we see protein problems is in the elderly they quit eating. You know, and for some reason when God said, oh it's time to die so quit eating and dehydrate so you don't feel anything, we in the hospital feel it's necessary for us to hydrate you so you can feel everything and of course the family goes, oh no, you know, grandma is dying and if she's not eating then so we pump protein in and and keep them going. We do amazing things down there. We had one somebody tell us today, I'm just waiting for God to decide when to take Uncle Harry. And I said, God decided three weeks ago when we put him on the vent, we're the one keeping him alive. But, you know, hey, what can I tell you? Don't quote me, I'm only on video here. <laughs> yes? Oh, that's a good question. I'm a diabetes educator and I have a hard, you know, taking it away. When I was doing my PhD, they were just okay and doing the work on um, a NutraSweet. And a NutraSweet is an amino, two amino acids. There are 22 basic amino acids and, and uh, an organic chemist that worked for the cereals company. And if you ever know any, any organic chemists in here, so I can badmouth you pretty well. The organic chemists tend to be eccentric. And uh, I have a son who's one, so I can say that. Uh, and he spills a purified amino acid across the counter. Let me tell you something about amino acids. You all know what they taste like separated because your stomach digests protein. And so when you heave your cookies, that taste, a lot of that is purified amino acids separated from each other. We're used to eating it in a long chain. And when you <laughs> divide them up, it's not too good. This guy tastes it. I don't know what would have occurred for him to taste stuff off his counter, I don't know, but it knocked him down sweet and NutraSweet was born. So NutraSweet is a form of two amino acids and uh, it's very, very sweet and 
It has been researched and researched and researched. It's the most researched molecule on the planet by most major universities. They have yet to hang on everything, but we continually hear how horrible it is. And on top of that, everybody, I can't use any of the artifacts. They're all different. They're all different molecules. What they do is they trigger into that tongue and they turn it. And then we've heard, oh, but they fool your brain and so they make you hungrier. Okay. No, they don't fool your brain. That's why they're hu you're hungrier. Because if they fooled your brain, you wouldn't be hungrier because your brain would have thought you ate. And then they, well, it causes insulin response. No, you know what? Your brain's pretty smart. It knows the difference between sugar and an artificial sweetener. Uh, and all of this, the FDA, and it has been researched, all of the artificial sweeteners, all of them, are okay for every age and range of humans in the United States. So, if you go to the FDA, they said, we haven't found anything that any of them do, and you can give it to pregnant women on up. Now, whether you want to or not, I don't know. But there is no proof that they do any harm at all. They don't cause diabetes, by the way. Well, people with diabetes eat a lot more sugar-free stuff, and they have diabetes. Well, why do you think they're eating the sugar-free stuff? And most of our diabetics tend to be overweight, type 2 diabetics, so they have switched to the lower calorie stuff a long time ago. And they have diabetes. I certainly don't think one follows the other. That answer your question? Now, when my clients come to me and say, I read on the internet that, that these sugar substitutes are killing me, so I went back to Coke. I said, I don't know whether the sugar substitutes are killing you or not. It is up to you. You do not have to use sugar substitutes. But you can't go back to Coke. <laughs> you know, unless you want to die much younger than you need to. You know, God did not come down from heaven and say, ding, you're an American citizen. You have a right to a sugar, a sweetened flavored beverage at every meal. Drink water, unsweetened tea. You do not have to go back to sugar because you gave up sugar-free beverages. My husband, I've decided to give up NutraSweet. I don't care what you said. So here we are shopping. So he went past his soda. He drinks too much soda and it's a discussion. But, you know. And he reached over to pick up his Crystal Light and I said, ah! Crystal Light's got NutraSweet in it? Yeah. You know, and he was giving up the Splenda too. Everything that, you know, finally he says, you know, I agree with you. I don't think this causes any harm. <laughs> So, yes? I have found time and time again, though, that the aspartame, mm -hmm. even though I have low blood pressure, I don't have a health problem, but it causes pain in my legs. Uh, the most common thing that people complain about is um, headaches with it. And you know when I tell people, this is the most powerful organ, and if you believe it, whether it does or not, it'll do it. So I say to avoid it. Do you, can, does Splenda give you problems? No. And there are so many Splenda things. Splenda is actually, Splenda is sugar that's been modified so it's not absorbable. It's a totally different molecule. Um, so I would say avoid it. This only the secret way I would do that would be to, to, to double blind you. In other words, give you capsules of stuff you don't know what it is and see if it still does it. You know, and, and you know, there was an allergist one time. He says, I tell people you're allergic to protein. You can't be allergic to this. He said, I had a lady come in one time. She says, the only thing in the world I'm allergic to, she says, I don't have hay fever. I don't have anything. And to have a food allergy, you almost always have some sort of dust allergy. It runs, you know. And, he, <laughs> and she says, I'm allergic to carrots. He said, you can't be allergic to carrots. He says, we double blinded her and she lit up like a Christmas tree when we uh, gave her carrots. He says, so I never say, you can't be. Organic just means that it has been certified free of pesticides and or uh, those kind of additives and it has nothing to do with the nutrition. Nothing at all. Personally, until they prove to me that people who eat organic actually have some sort of a health advantage compared to people who don't, I'm not willing to pay the extra. I'm a farmer. I'm not scared of a little seven dust. Maybe I should be. And in, but until I see better proof, I personally am not willing to pay the extra. 
Um, and I grow my own garden, and well, I hate to tell you this, but I've hit it with a little seven dust, not again. Those little, like my little plant the other day, I pulled it up, and there was a cutworm. I was stomping around my garden. That's the best way to get rid of a cutworm, but everything else got a little seven dust. Um, that's what organic is, and if you can afford it and you want to do it, there are lists on the internet of which fruits and vegetables are, are more susceptible to pesticides. You know, where, so you're getting actually more bang for your buck for which things are more likely to actually have some of those in it. Remember that the average cabbage has 2,000 chemicals in it. Nobody's, nobody's actually studied, and a large percent of those are pesticides naturally. You know, plants can defend themselves, just like everything else. So, and they might be carcinogenic, but our bodies are designed to deal with a lot of carcinogens in every plant too. So, it's it's a very technical world out there, and I don't believe there is one thing that you can point to and say this is what's causing all the problems. It's a multifactorial stew, but something's going on. All these auto meat. I think we're too clean for one thing. That one. Now we're back to sucking on the. <laughs> on the past fire <laughs> to the baby. Uh, throw away all your antibacterial stuff and build an immune system. Yes? I just irritates me to death. <laughs> the government defines what these are and they have you they have chosen to use juice. And it is, you know, and, and my clients will buy juicers. And of course, they never use them very long because they're a whole lot of work and they're really expensive, you know. And, and I'll say, the only person who has advantage of the juice is the guy that sells you the juicer. <laughs> well, it has all these enzymes in it. You need these enzymes. I said, enzyme is a chemical that a cell makes to help itself do a job. I'm not sure what carrot enzymes are supposed to do for me. They probably were good for the carrot. Okay, enzymes by definition are protein. Okay, so you're going to digest them. Oh, well, I need this juice to help me digest. I said, You've gained 20 pounds in the last 20 years, you're digesting just fine. <laughs> you know, I, I, well, I need it to digest better. I teach day in and day out make your food as hard to digest as possible. Make the 26 feet of your digestive tract do its job. The main problem we have is we have refined and processed our food so it doesn't have to work. Oh, you know, I'm afraid my, I can't eat these two foods together, they won't digest. I said, are you having digestive problems? Do you have diarrhea? Do your stools float? Are you rapidly losing weight? No. Then you're digesting. You know, oh, you know, I to, they're always wanting to take something that makes it easier to digest. No, I tell my diabetics, slow, the, eat whole grains, eat beans, eat vegetables, require your digestive tract to do its job. 200 years ago, you didn't have refined breads and cereals. You didn't have cold cereals. You didn't have any of this stuff. Everything was whole grain and mixed together, and you had to separate it and grind it and digest it. And that's why your digestive tract is the way it is. And it's so long and it's involved. It is designed to deal with lots of hard to digest stuff. My time is up. You have been a wonderful audience. I'm Oh, oh, yeah. Uh, um, I'm the dietitian at Houston Medical. Let's see, you can call the big vein hospital and ask for the dietitian's office. You'll probably get me or one of my colleagues. I don't even know the number. I can't even tell you my office number because I have to look at it every time. I am old. The numbers do not stick with me. I can remember facts and percents, but I can't remember phone numbers. I'm just no help whatsoever, am I? But you can get with me at Houston. We have a speaker's bureau down there. We have a wonderful diabetes education program. I worked in it for years, uh, for those of you that live in Houston County. But I'm easy to get a hold of just through the hospital. Yes? Brenner, B-R-E-N-N-E-R. -E -E that is on the slide. OK. You've been nice. This has been fun. Thank you.